meeting. I'm going to start by the reintroduction of commissioners and staff. Aaron Ryder, Columbus. Emmerich Cross, Kansas City. Troy Spore, Oakley. Lauren Sill Hutchison. I'm Gerald Lauber from Topeka. Bill Escarino, Garden City. I don't see Warren on tonight. She, Sheila Chemis, Commission Support. Uh, I'm Brad Loveless, Secretary from Topeka. Mike Miller, Assistant Secretary in Pratt. I made it on time, Mr. Chairman. I'm proud of you. <laughs> at this moment, we, at this time, we welcome and encourage uh, general public comment on non-agenda items. Is there anybody in the audience who has anything they'd like to bring before the commission? You can do so by using the under reactions, use the raise hand function and we'll get you turned on and announced. Any hands raised? I'm not seeing any at this time and nobody's communicated directly norm to me. So I think we're good. All right. And we're going to start back with the general discussion and we're going to talk about forward facing sonar with Ben Neely. All right. Thank you all. Let me get this pulled up here. Hopefully we're full screen now. Um, so last winter, there was a lot of comments about live scope and how it was influencing catch of, of crappie in some of these impoundments. Uh, there were some concerns that it was cheating, that it was creating opportunities for people to take more than their share. Um, and we got to discussing it in the fisheries division and we talked about it a lot. And we, we kind of realized that we didn't have a lot of experience with it. So we've got to study together to actually go fishing with live scope and try to scientifically investigate whether or not it could influence our catch. So there was a whole bunch of people that helped out with this. Uh, we had individuals from fisheries, from wildlife, from public lands. Um, we had a few folks that were local volunteers that have been helping as seasonal workers with the agency for years. Uh, so we had a good, a good turnout. And I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about crappie in Kansas. So, Black and white crappie are common in, in Kansas impoundments. Um, I'm going to lump them as crappie because that's what 99% of our anglers do from here on out. And they support popular fisheries. And uh, most recently, they're the second most targeted species group in Kansas. Now, historically, the crappie fishing has really dialed in on the spring spawn. Recently, though, we seem to have a lot more anglers chasing these winter congregations on structure. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, in, in spring, the crappie will come in shallow. They're accessible to shoreline anglers uh, when they're spawning. Um, they're big. They're relatively easy to catch. And in wintertime, they, they can be a lot more difficult to find. Uh, but when you find them, there's typically a whole bunch of them. They'll stack up on channel ledges or on trees or uh, some underwater structure. Um, and anglers that get on them can typically catch a bunch. So statewide with crappie, we have no minimum length limit. And we have 50 a day. We do have a few special regulations in the state, 12-inch um, minimum length limit, five per day. We have a 10-inch minimum of 50 per day, a 10-inch minimum and 20 per day, no minimum and 20 per day. And then on Missouri boundary waters, we have no minimum and 30 per day. So that kind of asks the question, you know, what's, what's the problem? So uh, Susan, Steffen, Susan Steffen is our human dimension specialist. And she is currently working on the 2019 license angler survey or 2020 license angler survey. Um, and I asked her about comments on live scope. She asked individuals to fill this survey out for comments and they're all over the board. And, and we extracted these three comments uh, that, that pertain to live scope and crappie and none of them are really all that positive. 
the, the take home message that we're getting from anglers is that we need to be focusing on these crappie limits because anglers with live scope are very effective at catching these fish. Uh, and we need to have this on our radar and, and take care of it before it gets out of control. So talking about live scope, um, I refer to it as live imaging sonar, live scope. Live scope is a, is a trade name uh, for Garmin. It seems to kind of caught on with a lot of the public. Um, but it, it's, a, it's essentially like a, a regular old fish finder, except it can see in more higher detail. Um, I don't know if, I hope you can see my cursor, but on this photo on the top left, uh, you can see a boat and it has this uh, aluminum arm and then there's a little bitty transducer on there. And you can angle that to point straight ahead, point down. Um, you can lay it sideways and see a big fan in front of you, but it's a sonar and it kicks out that signal and that return comes back and that's how you can see what you're looking at in, in higher definition. And the way anglers fish this is they, they'll typ typically put it on the front of their boat and then it's, it's kind of along the lines of playing a, a video game or watching a flasher. If you do ice fishing, you, you can see your jig, you can see uh, everything that's going on underneath you on this big TV screen there in front. And when you, you look at the image um, on, the, on the screen, it takes a little bit to kind of understand what you're looking at. What we're looking at here is a, a tree um, underneath all of those kind of limbs that are radiating up are trees, all of those spots above it are fish. So this live scope allows you to, and I'm sure these jigs are on here too, but you can't see those or I don't know where they are, uh, but you can watch your jig move. You can see how your fish respond to the jig. Um, it gives us this opportunity to actually see what's going on under the water where historically uh, we haven't really been able to do that. And again, the problem uh, that people are worried about is that it's resulting in too much harvest. So it kind of seems like a good thing. Like, um, people are catching fish. That's kind of what we're in the business of is giving people opportunity, uh, but it's creating division among anglers. And when we look at this, we, I guess we want to know why. And we look at the biological and it does angler catch increase with the use of, of live scope or live imaging sonar. Uh, does it result in larger crappie being caught? And it, if it does, can this result in unsustainable harvest to our crappie populations? And then another side of this is the, the social component. So maybe this is an issue of the haves or the have nots. Um, envy can come into play where folks see individuals fishing one way and they want to be, you know, they want to participate in it. But right now the cost of entry into this live scope market is uh, a couple thousand dollars for a lower end unit and up to six, seven, eight thousand dollars for some of the higher end units. Uh, perhaps it's increased visibility. People like showing off when they catch a bunch of fish. Uh, you typically don't see them showing off when they have bad days. Uh, so we're seeing these reports of anglers catching a lot of fish. The live scope pops out and, and, you know, maybe we're seeing some increased visibility there. And then there's also the zero sum mentality where we're thinking about crappie being a finite resource. There's only a certain number of them in the reservoir. So if you catch one, that's one less for me to catch. So when we ask the question, how does live imaging sonar affect the catch of crappies? It's, it's a really loaded and complicated question. There's a, any number of things that go into creating happy anglers or sad anglers. And when we think about fisheries, uh, traditionally we think about the, the fish, the fish population, the behavior, the forage, uh, the fish community. We think about the anglers themselves where we have angler skill, angler equipment, a familiarity with the water body coming into play. We have habitat where we think about habitat availability or habitat association. And then there's just these um, uh, things that we can't really control where we're looking at weather, we're looking at water level, we're working at wind. And if one of these goes sideways, it can really influence your catch. So when we set out to do this experiment, we wanted to think about what variability we could control. We wanted to, to standardize as much as we could so we could test the live scope specifically without getting into the weeds of these other factors. When we're thinking about fish population, fish behavior, forage, fish community, uh, the idea came up to take a, an impoundment that had, you know, fairly similar habitat throughout and cut it in half. So we created two impoundments out of Cedar Bluff Reservoir. Uh, we had a north half and we had the south half. The weather was the same on both those halves every day, the water level, the wind, all that was the same. So essentially we had two exact same populations um, that we had, you know, separated into north and south assuming those fish didn't move during this, this study. We look at angler skill, angler equipment, and angler familiarity. This one is a little bit more difficult. Uh, we were able to standardize equipment. 
we uh, provided uh, an assortment of jig heads, an assortment of, of different types of soft plastics to give anglers the same uh, tackle box to, to chase these fish. When we think about the habitat, habitat availability, habitat association, uh, Dave Spalsberry is the biologist out at Cedar Bluff, and he has done a phenomenal job of creating these artificial reefs where he just continues to add fish habitat over and over into these similar areas. And what we end up with are these big room-sized brush piles, and there's about an equal number of them on the north side and the south side. So everybody was fishing in this same similar you know, type of brush pile habitat. Uh, we also standardized this by doing it all during a two-week period in December. So we, we actually started on the, the last Monday of November there, and then we went two weeks and finished on December 9th. So thinking about this variability we can control, if you, if you look at this, this figure, uh, what we're assuming here is that the left side, the 10% of the anglers are the, the folks that aren't very experienced, the folks that aren't very skilled, um, the folks that had a bad day, uh, you know, however you want to look at it. We have the 10% on the right. Those are the folks that are, are going to catch fish no matter what. Um, we, all, we all know a lot of those, or at least some of those individuals, uh, just seems like they can always find them. This 80% in the middle is what we're dialed in on. We're, we're trying, what, what we tried to do for this experiment was look at the casual weekend angler. We tried to set this up as two individuals that were familiar with fishing, uh, familiar with crappie fishing, familiar with live scope, go to a new lake and fish for two days, fish for the weekend to see if, if, if this live scope made a difference on their catch. So looking at this, I won't drill down into this too far, um, but we ended up with 32 anglers split into 16 teams. Uh, the way we had it set up was, was four teams fishing daily. They fished for seven hours each day, one day with live scope, one day without. All of these anglers had access to a live scope about five months prior to the experiment so they could get familiar with it, uh, understand how it works. And what ended up happening was each team would fish either the north side or the south side the first day with or without live scope. And then the other day they would fish the other side and then either with or without live scope, whichever they didn't do the first day. The folks that were not using live scope still use the traditional 2D sonar. They could use side scan, they could use down scan. They just couldn't turn on the actual live scope transducer. And then we measured and recorded all captured fish, regardless of species. And we uh, told folks to treat it as a tournament where the total length of all crappie caught determined the winners. Uh, this was to try to keep them, try to again, emulate these crappie fishermen where they would uh, stay on these, on these brush piles, leave if they were catching small crappie, leave if they were catching white bass, uh, trying to get them to dial in on, on crappie. So ended up anglers caught 436 fish representing 10 species. 47% of those were crappie. Uh, white bass comprised 36%. This is overall, everybody combined. When we're looking at just the live scope, we had 231 fish captured. 110 of those were crappie when they were using the live scope. And when they weren't using the live scope, we had 205 fish captured and 95 of those were crappie. So fairly similar catch when we're looking at it, just the raw numbers. And when we look at these teams and the way they play out, uh, I kind of got a kick out of this because it followed that, that curve. Um, and, I, and I had to take team names out so I don't uh, call anybody out on their great fishing or not so great fishing. But we kind of saw this same thing where we had one team that just really caught a lot of fish, one team really struggled, and then the rest of the teams were really pretty similar through there. And this is just separating that out a little bit, uh, looking at each team where the, the blue was the number of crappie caught. Uh, the further it went right, the more fish they caught. The gray was other species. But what I want to point out here is that nine of these teams caught more crappie with live scope than without. That means seven of these 16 teams caught more crappie without live scope than with. And then when we look at all species combined, only seven teams caught more fish total when they use live scope and nine of the 16 teams caught less fish total when they use live scope. Uh, I, I put some statistics to it. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about this at a conference here in a, in a few weeks. Um, but the, the take home message here is that we didn't, we didn't see much significant here. We saw a, a slight significant difference where anglers on the south side of the lake using live scope uh, tended to catch more fish than the other four groups, south side without, north side with, or north side without. And that was all species combined. When we knocked this down to crappie, we just didn't see any difference. And that's the, 
the take home message here is that we just couldn't find a difference. There was something else influencing this catch. Uh, size of fish is something that comes up a lot that anglers can, can really dial in and target these big fish. Um, without live scope, so what we're doing here is the length of the fish is on the, the bottom, the horizontal axis. Uh, the higher the bar, the more fish that were caught. You can see the 10 inch fish, those were predominant. That's what we caught the most of. Um, we saw a few more of these, small, or these smaller fish without the live scope, the blue bars on the left side. We saw a few more of the, the bigger fish with anglers fishing with the live scope, which are the taller gray bars on the right side. But when we look at the sum of this, the, the whole thing, it was, it was really very similar. The smallest fish was the same size. The, the median fish or the, the average fish was the same size, three tenths of an inch off. Um, and the largest fish were, were very similar as well. So to give you some conclusions, uh, what we got out of this was variability and crappie catch and this experiment was explained by factors other than live scope. Uh, that means that probably angler skill, probably angler familiarity with the system, um, angler experience, things that we couldn't control for were influencing catch much more than just having access to this live scope unit. That said, we did have some evidence that live scope can increase catch in certain conditions. Uh, in this experiment, it was the south side and capturing all fish. Uh, that seems fairly specific to this lake, but it does kind of point out that, that this is certainly a, a possibility, which, which makes sense. We would suspect that that's a possibility, which is why we did the, the project. And then the same size crappie were caught with and without live scope. So we were not, in our study, we were not able to dial in on these bigger fish. So the... The next part here is, is, you know, so what? What do we do next? So we address this live scope use for casual weekend anglers. Again, there's, there's only so many things you can control. Uh, the biggest knock that we've got on this from peers is, you know, what about the experts? Uh, it seems like everybody knows somebody that can get out and, and really catch a lot of these fish when they're using live scope. And I think the question we have to answer is whether those individuals are going to catch a lot of fish regardless, whether they're using a live scope, whether they're not using a live scope. Um, you know, and, and if it is related to the live scope, how can we, can we quantify that for these anglers that are, are experts in the technology? Uh, the question, can we control potential impacts with creel limits? You know, this is the, the, one of the oldest ways to manage fisheries up there with stocking fish is to regulate harvest. Um, we get to the point where, you know, it, it, it may not matter what technology individuals use because one of the tools we have in our toolbox is a length limit and a bag limit. So we can regulate them from that component if we need to. Uh, looking at the relative impact of, of live scope on the biological and social components of a fishery, uh, our, our experiment did not provide evidence that live scope is gonna increase catch. Uh, talking with folks afterwards, anecdotally, um, you know, a lot of them, seem to think that it would. So there seems to be different perceptions. Uh, people seem to remember these things differently, uh, you know, based on their experiences rather than what the actual numbers say at the end of the day. And then lastly, uh, what about other species? So we have another project coming up uh, this summer. We're gonna look at blue catfish. Uh, crappie are one of those species that are fairly difficult to over harvest, especially in larger impoundments. Uh, when we start looking at some of these larger fish, these larger bodied fish, blue catfish, uh, we have a lot more potential to see over harvest of these individuals, mainly because they are 20 years old before they get to these big sizes. Uh, I don't know if you all are familiar with the story that the paddlefish out of Oklahoma, but the, the guy down there that was having great success at Keystone has attributed a lot of that success to using the live scope, finding the fish that they're looking for, and then targeting those individual fish. And we're kind of questioning whether that might be coming uh, for blue catfish or for flathead catfish. Uh, so that's the, the long and short of it. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all about our, our project and I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all might have. Are there any questions for Ben? It's an interesting report. Well, I guess you've answered all the all the questions. Well, I guess I'll take it then. All if right. anybody has any questions, my email address is down here. Please feel free to reach out to me and I'll answer whatever I can. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's move on to crappie management. <clears throat> Hi, 
All right. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. All right. Trying to pull up my screen here. All right. And everybody can see that screen all right? Yes. All right, very good. Um, well, my name is Jeff Cook. I am uh, the fisheries research supervisor in Emporia. Um, we're gonna kind of stay on the, the, the vein of crappie that Ben kind of started. Um, um, this talk isn't quite as <laughs> exciting and the studies weren't quite as fun as that one, but I'm gonna try to give you a, a semi-coherent idea of, of how we approach crappie management in Kansas. Um, where we've been, uh, where we are, and, and where we might go in the future. Got multiple pointers around here, so it's kind of bugging me. Okay, here we go. So Ben did a good job of kind of explaining a little introduction to crappie biology. Of course, we have the, the two species, the white crappie uh, and the black crappie. White crappies are uh, a little bit more adapted to our larger, more turbid uh, reservoirs, whereas the black crappie are more suited towards uh, clearer, more highly vegetated, uh, smaller impoundments. But crappie in general can really be characterized by uh, just variability. Um, they're a highly variable creature, probably one of the most variable fish species that we manage. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of an introduction into um, the dynamic rate functions that kind of govern fish populations on the right there. They're all interconnected, but they can be summarized uh, by three main categories, growth, uh, which is simply, you know, how fast a fish either puts on somatic length or somatic, somatic weight. Um, the second one is recruitment. Now, recruitment's kind of a, a difficult nut to crack or wrap your head around because recruitment can really mean um, entering into some life stage of a fish. So a fish can recruit to uh, age zero in the fall. So that means it survives until its first fall. Um, it can recruit to age one, which means it lives through its first, uh, first winter or it can recruit to the recreational fishery when people would want to catch or, or harvest these fish. But um, again, recruitment of, of crappie is very erratic and variable, and it's driven uh, highly by environmental variables. Um, this third dynamic rate function I wanna talk about is mortality, which simply put is the number of, or the percentage of fish uh, in a fish population that die each year. Uh, and mortality gets a little bit more complicated because you can partition different parts of, of mortality of a population. So you have natural mortality. So that's mortality that happens outside of fishing, you know, due to predation or disease or, or just any other factor. And then the other uh, part of mortality can be fishing mortality or exploitation, which I'm going to get into in a little bit, which is mortality, you know, specifically attributed uh, to anglers. So again, all these variables kind of work together um, and, and basically drive these populations. But again, variability is the name of the game with crappie. So Ben did a good job of kind of setting up the emerging challenges and kind of why we're, we're kind of wound up about crappie right now. We're getting a lot of comments because quite frankly, the fishing has been, you know, really good in the last few years. The flood of 2019 allowed for a lot of nutrients, a lot of good spawning habitat. It put off a lot of good, uh, good year classes in some of our reservoirs. So uh, people are, are excited about crappie right now, and that's a good thing. But there are some of these challenges that we're going to have to deal with as fisheries managers, fisheries managers and stewards of the resource. Um, ben did a really good job of, of describing live Im imaging sonar. But not only that, we're having improvements in standard 2D sonar. Um, you know, improved trolling motor technology. We don't have to chuck an anchor out and hope we stay on top of a brush pile anymore. Um, if the fish move five feet that way, we can push one button and be right on top of the school again. So um, that's also handy. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have, you know, the communication between anglers like we do now. Um, you can post a picture on social media and somebody can figure out, you know, that's the Clinton Dam in the background. I know where that guy is. Um, they can head out there, um, they can send their buddy five states away, a GPS point, and he can be there in the morning on a hot bite. So, um, you know, we can also now with our technology on our, our electronics, we can map the habitat that we're fishing. So we can find channels that we didn't know existed. We can find this winter habitat that, that we didn't know is there. So all of these things are kind of working together. And in, in my opinion, increasing the ability for crappie anglers to succeed. So um, it's a good time for us to step back and look at the science, what we've done and, and where we need to go from here. 
So Ben uh, mentioned, you know, what current crappie restrictions we have at our reservoirs. And I'll be mainly focusing on large reservoirs because that's where the lion's share of our crappie um, harvest comes from. Uh, but again, the statewide, uh, no minimum length limit, 50 per day. Uh, that's the, the vast majority of our reservoirs. Uh, we do have 10 inch minimum length limits at a few of our, our reservoirs, uh, 20 per day, uh, reduced creel limit at a few. And then of course we have Coffee County, which is a five per day, 12 inch minimum length limit, but that's kind of a special scenario um, that, that the owners of that power plant lake uh, want to keep a high density of, of you know, piscivorous pisiv fish to reduce gizzard chat abundances. But, but that's what we have currently. Uh, one of Tom Mosier's studies in, in the year 2000 kind of attempted to uh, evaluate these 10 inch minimums that we have. Uh, the first ones of these in, in the state uh, were implemented in, a, in the early 90s in the eastern Kansas Revo reservoirs of Perry, Pomona, and Melvern. And the general objective of these regulations were to simply reduce mortality. And hopefully that would allow these fish to grow bigger and increase uh, angling success, not only in numbers, but also size of fish harvested. So what uh, this study found out that after uh, three and five years of following these fish through creel surveys and, and, and standard uh, fish population sampling was that uh, we did achieve the objective of, of reducing harvest um, up to, you know, 40 to 60 percent, which is pretty substantial. Um, but unfortunately, the mortality of these populations was generally unchanged. Um, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but um, compensatory mortality is something that we really need to think about when it comes to this. Um, you know, crappie don't live that long. Um, we have generally pretty high natural mortality. So if a fish isn't caught and harvested in a given year, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to die of natural causes anyway. So that's probably why this, uh, these uh, length limits didn't show a little bit more promise. Um, in this study, the average age of fish slightly increased, um, but yield was decreased. So the amount of fish that people were taking home actually uh, ended up decreasing. Uh, and that was because people generally weren't harvesting these smaller fish. But the bottom line from this study was that angling was only marginally better in one out of the three study lakes. Um, so uh, it wasn't a ringing endorsement of these 10 inch minimums from this study. Uh, uh, another study that, that Mosier and, and others did, a lot of people from the fisheries division did, um, this was in the early to mid 2000s, it was an exploitation study. So uh, what exploitation means again is just what percentage of the fish are exploited by anglers from a population in a given year. So they did this study at Cedar Bluff, Clinton, Hillsdale, Melvern, and Perry. Uh, so basically you go out and tag a bunch of fish and basically, you know, see how many anglers catch and harvest and call in. And what they found was that exploitation varied from anywhere from about 12 to 60%. The average was about 35%. Um, that text on the right, that table there uh, kind of summarizes the exploitation rates in, in these different reservoirs when the fish were tagged at different times. Um, but what they found was 35% was, was exploited by anglers, um, but natural mortality, you know, they followed these fish throughout the years and they found that the natural mortality varied between 14 and 70%. So natural mortality was actually higher than, than, than exploitation. And you add those together roughly and you get, you know, this, this overall mortality rate which means that average survival of these fish in a given year is about 25%. So approximately 75% of the crappie in these populations uh, were dying in a given year um, with the combination of exploitation and natural mortality. Um, now you might be wondering, you know, if we take that exploitation out of there with regulation, um, does that mean that overall mortality is going to be lower and the fishing is going to improve? But you know, there's been a whole bunch of these studies throughout North America, and what they found is that natural mortality has to be, you know, about 30 percent, maybe even 40 on the high side, um, you know, for these uh, length restrictions to work. And we had that average of about 40 percent, which is a little on the high side. So that's probably why um, we're not seeing real great, uh, you know, mind uh, mind blowing success with these regulations. 
Uh, to further along this vein of crappie exploitation, we have a, a more contemporary example of something that's going on right now. Um, Nancy Johnston is a graduate student at Missouri State University, and she's doing a, a very similar study to what Mosier did. Uh, and she's doing that at Elk City, Big Hill, and Parsons City Lake right now. Um, they tagged a bunch of fish throughout the, the last year, and they're watching tag returns come in. Um, and what they found is exploitation has actually been pretty low in those systems, anywhere from about 5 to 30%. Um, so a little bit lower than the other studies. Um, but one really noteworthy kind of mind-blowing thing, at least for me, was that they, they did a population estimate of crappies uh, at Parsons City Lake. Um, and they found that there's about 290 crappie, eight inches or larger per acre in that lake. So it is a productive system. It might be a little bit of an anomaly, but it just you know goes to show you what our productive waters can actually produce uh, in regard to crappie populations. Another study that we're currently uh, under or, or doing right now with the help of uh, Jim Miazga, he was the graduate student on this project. He started at Emporia State with this. Um, he's actually going to be the new Clinton biologist here in about two weeks, but um, we worked with him to kind of investigate the age and growth population parameters of about 40 to 45 of our, you know, most popular crappie impoundments. And what he found here is summarized on this table on the right. So I'll uh, attempt to summarize this. So these are each individual impoundment and they're ordered from the slowest growing to the fastest growing um, by this metric of mean length at age two. So he aged a bunch of these otoliths, saw how, how old these fish were, how fast they were growing. And these slow growing populations were getting to, you know, uh, six or eight or nine inches at age two. You know, the moderate growing populations were anywhere from 10 to 11 inches. And these fast growing individuals were, you know, anywhere from 11 to 13 inches at age two. And if you, you'll notice a couple things, the first one is that in general, the, the larger the water body, the faster the growth. And also the larger the water body um, and the faster the growth, the, the, the less the longevity there. You know, these slow growing populations, these fish are living forever. They're living, you know, um, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12 years old. Um, the average growing fish are growing some or dying somewhere, you know, you know, six to maybe 10, like that Parsons City Lake. But these really fast growing, high quality crappie populations, um, they're not living much more than three or four or five years old. So it just goes to show you that, that high mortality in these populations is not necessarily a bad thing. But we also need to think about this and frame our questions uh, with these data about what these you know, what the implications for minimum length limits are um, from this data. It seems like our mortality is pretty high here, but our growth's pretty high. So, you know, with that mortality rate being pretty high, uh, a minimum length limit might not be appropriate uh, here. So just some things that we need to think about. Uh, some more uh, data from Jim's project here. Um, this might take a little bit of explaining. So what we did was model these populations. So these graphs are the results from those models. Um, this axis here represents number of fish. So number of fish harvested or number of fish reaching 300 millimeters in these population um, simulations. So what we did here is we started with a hypothetical population of 100 fish. So they're subjected to um, their growth parameters. They're subjected to mortality every year. Um, they're not subjected to fishing mortality until they recruit into these different length limit scenarios. So this is a no length limit scenario. This is an eight inch minimum. This is a 10 inch minimum. And this is a 12 inch minimum. So as you can see, the number of fish harvested with increasing restriction decreases, which makes sense. You know, more fish die of natural causes compared to being harvested as the, that minimum length limit increases the number of fish reaching 12 inches increases because less of those fish are being taken out. And in this scenario, um, the yield of fish, you can see yield in the black bars denoted on this axis over here, actually increases to a point which is maximized by about a 10 inch minimum length limit and actually decreases with a 12 inch minimum length limit because more of these fish are dying of natural causes. Now, one really important thing to note here is this CM of 25%, that is the natural mortality rate. So again, I said that, you know, we think that our natural mortality rates are somewhere in the, you know, 40% range. So this is probably low um, in this instance. But if you increase that to 45%, you can see how the trends change. 
The number of fish, fish harvested with increasing regulation, again, decreases. However, yield stays about the same for the most part, and that's because these fish are dying of natural causes and not being harvested when that natural mortality is high. So if this is a reasonable natural mortality rate for our populations, again, uh, a minimum length limit doesn't really make uh, a whole lot of sense in a lot of instances. So kind of switching gears a little bit from minimum length limits to uh, creel limits, so, so bag limit, another way that we can uh, minimize harvest. So this graph on the right here is um, creel data. It's actual empirical data that our creel clerks collected from uh, about 15 to 20 large impoundments that had a creel limit of 50, so the statewide minimum. So in each one of these bars is the frequency at which, you know, that number of fish was caught by the anglers. So you can see, you know, these anglers were really successful. They limited. But in general, our harvest is really driven by um, catches of under 10 fish per day. Now, this line here represents how much that harvest would be decreased um, with each one of these um, reduced creel limits. So if we reduced our creel limit to 10 per day, go up to the line, uh, you know, where the math works out, how much that would be de decrease our overall harvest, it's about 25% creel reduction with a 10 fish uh, minimum or a 10 fish daily limit. If we increase that to, to 20 fish, it only decreases our, our harvest by about 10%. So um, I guess it's kind of subjective what we consider to be a biologically significant uh, amount of harvest decrease, but um, I don't think that I'd consider 10% uh, uh, a biologically significant, 25% maybe, but in general, if we want to decrease harvest by a meaning, meaningful number, we're gonna have to decrease harvest to probably around 10 fish or less. So it kind of begs the conclusion that crappie bag limits may provide, you know, the perception of a more even distribution of harvest among, among anglers, uh, but biologically, um, it might not provide anything concrete. So to just kind of summarize and wrap all this up, um, again, crappie harvest restrictions, it's really dependent on each population's, you know, growth, recruitment, and mortality. But in general, if growth is rapid, Length restriction, restrictions can be effective, but we also need to wrap our heads around how much mortality um, each system um, has going on. So angling mortality may actually be compensatory when natural mortality is high. Um, and even in, when angling mortality is high, persistent recruitment um, can go ahead and maintain those fisheries. And, and we're lucky in Kansas, we generally have pretty persistent recruitment. We have productive, productive waters, um, which generally lends us to have pretty good crappie fishing. But again, success of regulation depends on these factors, uh, including rapid growth, low natural mortality. And we need to remember that if we do regulate, these larger fish may come at the expense of overall yield. There's also some unintended consequences of regulation that we need to wrap our head around. Um, the first is, you know, if we put a regulation on a lake, we're probably gonna look at decreased pressure after regulation, because um, which leads into the second bullet point. Um, increased pressure at unregulated reservoirs. So um, if we go really restrictive on something at Perry, people just might go to Clinton where it's not as restrictive, or, or if both of those go restrictive, they might go to Hillsdale. So um, we're kind of just pushing pressure around. We also need to think that decreasing the bag limit may also increase harvest, which is really counterintuitive, but other states have seen this. Um, Nebraska is a good example. They went um, really restrictive on their panfish. I think they have a 15 fish per day bag limit, uh, and it used to be uh, 25 or 50, but 15 is a much more attainable limit than 25 or 50. So if an angler is sitting on 13 crappie in his live well, and the limit is 15 instead of 50, he might stick it out and catch those extra two where he, he would have just left before. So um, that has been proven that decreasing the bag limit can actually increase harvest. Um, and another take home from some other studies throughout North America is that minimum length limits, you know, they might work, they might not, but they have been shown to kind of reduce the variability of these crappie fishies, crappie fisheries. So they can maybe make a year class, uh, a big year class last a little bit longer than if it was subjected to harvest. So that's a lot of biological data, but I think one of the more, maybe the most important component uh, of crappie management is the sociological component, like Ben said. Um, these are data from that licensed angler survey that Susan Stephan uh, conducted about five years ago. 
And what this graph is, is relative support or opposition to these different um, cropping management scenarios. So you can see here that the 20 fish daily creel limit actually had the most support and it was really the only creel limit that was, you know, in general supported by um, the respondents to this survey. And you can see that uh, when we threw a 10 inch minimum on there, it was about the same pattern. Another thing to note about this is the size of the bubble. So the smaller the bubble and the smaller the number right there is the, the less variable the answers were. So there's less um, opportunity for conflict between the different groups. So that 20 fish creel limit was the most supported and it was also you know, the less conflict or the least conflicted uh, opportunity uh, of these different management scenarios. So to kind of wrap this up, uh, again, the effects of regulations can be variable. And it, again, it's dependent on population characteristics. Um, and the bottom line is that crop year regulations may largely be a sociological issue. And, and we do have data to suggest that the 20 per day might be the most palatable. However, it is worth noting that in those slow growing populations, uh, having any sort of regulation is probably not a really good idea because that can just exacerbate that slow growth if fish aren't being harvested out of there. So. Um, going to a statewide 20 per day, we'd end up probably having a lot of biologists wanting uh, a 50 per day uh, put on as well. So how we would enact that would take a little bit of thought. And again, crappie populations are cyclical. And if we want to reduce the variability, um, regulations may work um, to kind of ride out your classes a little bit longer. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's all I had. I Kind of went through that kind of quick, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Does anybody have any questions for Jeff? I know I get a lot of comments from people. Primarily, I'm from Topeka, so I get a lot of people that are concerned about over-harvested Pomona. I've kind of been under the conclusion that putting a limit on doesn't really make much difference but it tends to make people feel better. And uh, so that's probably the one lake that I get the most comments about because it is surrounded by 20 fish limit lakes. It has no minimum length limit. And uh, I've never really been sure what the answer is. So I'm glad to see what you have provided uh, but it still isn't going to satisfy some of the people that want 20 fish limit at certain lakes. Are there any other questions? Well, Jeff, you must have done as good a job as Ben did then. So thank you very much. Thank you. And anybody can email me if they have any questions. All right. Doug Nigren is going to talk about umbrella rigs. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, this is Doug Nigren, Fisheries Division Director. Uh, and I have a presentation tonight to just sort of bring you up to speed on the current uh, issue of umbrella rigs being used in Kansas. I'm going to try to share my screen. Are you seeing it okay? Okay, um, Emmerich Cross, the Commissioner Cross uh, contacted us a while back asking a question about uh, legalizing uh, umbrella rig use in Kansas, uh, meaning I think what he intended was being able to have uh, multiple hooks on there beyond the uh, statewide rule of no more than two lures on a line. So I thought I'd kind of go through some of the his history of the, of the umbrella or the, or the Alabama rig and how the department handled it early on, where we're at right now, and what's going on with some trends nationwide regarding the use of umbrella rigs. Um, these were used for many years in the ocean, a lot of times for striper fishing, and a lot of them were much bigger than the ones you see being tossed around on the end of uh, lines. They were being used primarily by trollers in, in saltwater for a long time. About a little over a decade ago, they started marketing them to uh, anglers to use them as a, something that could be casted on a smaller scale. And uh, when it came out, it was uh, pretty controversial because there were pictures of people catching three or four fish 
on one cast and uh, people were worried about him being too effective, kind of like the same kind of questions we're talking about with crappie exploitation now. <clears throat> so the agency was asked to look to determine if the umbrella rig could be made legal in Kansas. And uh, when it was all said and done, the department uh, looked at our regulations, and I'll show you some regs in a minute, and, and determined that you could use an Alabama rig in Kansas, but you, uh, had, you could have no more than two lure hooks on it. And so a lot of these are designed to have anywhere from three to seven hooks on the rig itself. Uh, but in Kansas, we restrict people to just using two lures on an umbrella rig. When they first came out, a lot of them had a trailing hook and we uh, were looking at some of the information on how these things were functioning and about 80% of the fish, as I recall, were being reported to be caught on the trailing hook and the other ones up front were just, weren't as attractive to uh, the predators that were trying to take advantage of these lures going through the water. So in Kansas, you could have uh, an umbrella rig um, and you could have something on each one of the clips there but only two of them could actually have a hook on it. So you could have other lures there, but with the hooks cut off. And if you put the hook, uh, if you put the lure out on the trailing and then one of the others, you have a pretty good chance of making that umbrella uh, rig work for you because you're gonna have all the flash and the attraction of a school of fish moving by and hopefully they'll hit that trailing hook and you'll be successful. Um, I did some checking around and to try to see what's going on around the country. And I started off by talking to some of the angling groups across the country. And I talked with Gene Gillen, who was the former assistant chief of fisheries in Arkansas, I mean, in, in Oklahoma. And Gene is now the conservation director for the Bass Angler Sportsman Society. That's the largest, uh, probably the largest uh, fishing organization um, in the country in terms of just the number of members they have. And it's the largest pro tour as well. They, they have the Bassmaster Classic each year. And it's been a very successful tournament trail. And Gene told me the history of the Alabama rig uh, as it related to the tournament trail was when it came out, these things were very effective and people were really catching fish with them. So many fish that they were having a lot of tournaments where there would be a pro angler in the front of the boat and an amateur angler in the back. And the amateur anglers were using these umbrella rigs and they were catching more fish than the pros. And so BASS banned the use of the umbrella rig in their tournaments and it's been banned ever since. Even if it was legal in a state to use it, they've not allowed it to be used in their tournaments. He did tell me though, that now over time, uh, these umbrella rigs are not as effective as they were when they first come, came out. And I think we see that time and time again where the more allure is presented in front of our fishes, uh, the, the uh, harder it is to catch fish on those lures over time. And that's what drives the whole lure industry. And every year you'll see a whole bunch of new innovative lures coming out because the fish haven't seen those yet and they haven't to learned to avoid them. So Gene told me though that BASS is probably going to allow the umbrella rig to be used in their tournaments next year in states where it's legal to do so. Uh, so that'll be, a, that'll be the first time that they've allowed that it's since the rigs were first started showing up in the marketplace. Um, the next slide I have is an explanation of where we're at right now and across the country in terms of where you can legally <coughs> use an umbrella rig and, and how many hooks you can have. And <coughs> the, this list probably can change from time to time depending on what's going on in, across the country. But in general, we're in that more conservative group with only allowing people to use two lures on an umbrella rig along with Arizona, Hawaii, Iowa, Maryland, Massachusetts, Nevada, North Dakota, and Vermont. There's quite a number of states that will allow three and you see them on the screen. Uh, and then really a lot of the states will allow you to bait it up all the way. If you've got five spots, you can put five lures on there and fish with an umbrella rig fully, de fully decked out. There are a few states that it's not legal to use them at all. Uh, but in general, I think we have uh, gone somewhat conservative compared to what uh, a lot of the other states have done with the use of the umbrella rig. And the reason that we did that is because in 115-7-1 under fishing legal equipment methods to take other provisions, we have, uh, we have stated that fishing lines with, that it's uh, the legal method of take is for fishing lines with not more than two baited hooks or two artificial lures per line. And so we considered each lure that was attached to an umbrella rig to be a separate lure. And that's how come we only allow two in Kansas. 
So you'll still see people fishing with two jigs on one line. You'll see people fishing, you know, with two baited hooks on a line and that's legal in Kansas, but no more than that. So to change that would also impact, uh, we'd have to change this regulation if we wanted to allow more than two uh, lures on an umbrella rig. So with that, I think really, I just want to throw it back to the commission and, and try to get some um, direction from the commission as to whether or not you feel like we should take a look at our regulations relating to the umbrella rig. Do we need to be a little more liberal? Do, is what we have now what we need? Um, I don't think there's any kind of a biological implication here. There was some concerns early on about fish getting foul hooked by smashing into a lure and then getting hooked by one of the other hooks on the umbrella rig. But I don't know that anybody's documented any really severe uh, problems with foul hooking or additional mortality related to the use of the umbrella rig. So at this point, I think I just take any questions from the commission and I would ask for the commission maybe to give us a little direction on what you would like the fisheries division to do in terms of um, looking into this uh, particular type of gear. Hey, any questions for Doug? Yes, Doug, this is Emmerich Cross. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really appreciate that and the information and certainly the history there. Uh, the reason I, I wanted to bring this issue up is I'm approached by a lot of fishermen, both uh, tournament fishermen and, and certainly non-tournament fishermen. And they've always asked me what was the purpose of... <coughs> with these fishermen is what difference does it make when how many hooks you have when we have creel limits and so that was the main issue for me is i couldn't defend this position because we do have creel creel limits you know, that, that limit the amount of fish you can take now are they always followed or not no that's another conversation for another day but but that was the main reason that i bought this issue forward i've had a few other fishermen state that when you buy these lures, such as the uh, Flash Mob Junior, the Umbrella Rig, they come with uh, a setup of five, which which I would support is up to five uh, uh, hooks on this on this type of a lure, and they would say, you know, cutting jig heads is, is one thing, and 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 tackles getting expensive, it's inconvenient, and they just didn't understand why you had to do any of it when we had creel limits anyway. So, so that is, that's where I'm at on this issue. And I've talked with my staff, Mr. Cross, about the issue. And, and I think we were of the opinion that you're right, that the length and creel limits can protect from excessive harvest. Uh, the question would be, how would we change our regulation to be able to accommodate an umbrella rig and not allow somebody to fish with five? Do we want to allow somebody to fish with five jigs on a single line as well? So we'd have to that that would have to that question would have to be answered, or how you could write a regulation that would give umbrella rigs an exemption to the two lures per per line rule. So that's why I was hoping maybe for some direction, and if the commission would like us to look into that and have our legal staff help us try to figure out how we could craft a change, I think we'd be more than happy to do that and and uh, and come back to you at a later date. I'm struggling to see what the practical reason is anymore on having a two hook minimum uh, other than you snag up more in the brush. So I don't know. I'd like to see the commission look into a way. The problem is you, uh, if you use the term umbrella rig, then somebody else has a brand that's very similar I don't know how you would word that to make an exception. I'd encourage staff to look into it further. Uh, Any with, other yeah. comments from the commission? Commissioner Spore, maybe that brings up a good, I can't catch fish with one hook. Maybe I need five. <laughs> Second. <laughs> would that help me? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's a big issue, Doug. I, I thought your presentation on crappie and live scope was outstanding with your whole group. But yeah, I think, um, I don't know that more hooks makes a big difference to me. 
I don't, I don't know that it's even an issue. Well, we can certainly uh, get with our legal staff and, and with the secretary and assistant secretary some more discussion on it. So maybe at a future commission meeting, we'll be able to uh, uh, come back with some more detail. We're going to be starting to workshop the regulation changes here in March. And so maybe at that first workshop or that first discussion, we can address this as well as some of the other changes we're looking at. When you do that, Doug, you will begin to receive a hue and cry for spider eggs. Yes. Yes. Because the point will be what's the difference in five individual hooks floating in the water versus five on one uh, piece of monofilament or one line. Right. Right. I think we can certainly address that as well. And it goes back to the same issue. You know, uh, some of this is sociological. Uh, biologically, we can control harvest with linked and elements as long as the gear isn't causing excessive hooking mortality. Uh, so uh, we can take a look at that and see what uh, we can come up with. Okay. Any other comments or questions for Doug? Chairman Lauber, I have, do have one from the public. Um, okay. If it's okay. Uh, Dustin King, I'm going to go ahead and get you unmuted here. Yeah, sorry, Jason. I, uh, I I'm just preparing for the next conversation, so I don't have anything. Oh, okay. No the, problem. But thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, if there's no other comments. Then let's turn it over to Levi for the CWD update. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Levi Jaster, Emporia, Kansas. Um, so tonight I'm going to give a, an update on chronic waste disease. I think the last time we did this was back in January of 2020. So uh, I'll kind of try to cover some of the last couple of years here. So chronic waste disease, just kind of a quick uh, reminder of what it is um, and some of the background is it is a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, uh, TSC. Uh, it's chronic waste disease, it's specific to the cervid. So deer, elk, moose, uh, that group. There are other forms. Uh, Scrapey is in sheep. Uh, BSE is the bovine, so that's mad cow disease. The human form is uh, Kutzfeld Jakobs disease. And then there's a few others. There's a feline form. There's a camel form of it. Um, there may be a few other, uh, or a couple other ones too. Uh, but chronic waste disease is a prion-based disease, which it is spread through a misfolded protein. Um, so it's not a viral or bacterial disease, uh, which makes it uh, pretty tough to deal with since prions are uh, also involved in other systems in the body. Uh, we know that it is always fatal. Uh, any deer that has gotten chronic waste disease has not, you know, does not live. Um, and we don't know of any cure or vaccine that uh, prevents it. Or, and it takes about a year and a half to two years for the signs to actually show up where you can look at an animal and tell that it has chronic waste and disease. Prior to that, uh, a deer or elk or moose, uh, any of those, they would uh, look uh, perfectly healthy. Um, and then once we see cr the clinical signs appear, uh, it's about a month to three months before the animal will die from it. And typically, chronic waste disease doesn't actually often kill the animal. They, it tends to weaken to the point that they die from something else, often uh, pneumonia, uh, predation, um, something like that. Uh, there are a few deer that have shown a slight resistance to CWD, but the, uh, that resistance is basically that they live a little longer, uh, which then means they could be spreading the prions uh, because they do shed them 
uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, and it is considered the biggest disease threat to North American cervids right now. Um, there's even discussions about how much of a threat it is to conservation in general, since in many states, uh, deer hunting has kind of been the golden goose um, for state agency income and providing a lot of funds through conservation programs. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So in uh, December of 2019, this is the map that uh, I showed from December 2019 and January of 2020 uh, for the national spread of CWD. And uh, two years later, this is where we are. Um, and basically we've just kind of, we've added a few more counties here and there. We've added a few more uh, captive deer facilities, um, just keeps continuing to creep out. Now to take a look at our more around the Kansas region and our neighboring states, there's where we were again in that December 2019. Levi, are you meaning to show us a presentation? We're not seeing not anything. Okay. Yeah, we're not seeing anything. We're just, not sorry. seeing anything. Let me... So when you started talking about maps, I was confused because we weren't My seeing My apologies. It. Thank you. Um, so there's our 2019 map for the region or for the state the na nation and Canada. And then we jump to 2022, uh, already spread just a little bit more filled in, going to the Kansas and December region in December, 2019. And uh, we see that, you know, there's pretty well, even the part of Kansas where we haven't, uh, hadn't detected it at the time was still pretty well surrounded. Um, a state south of Kansas, but north of Texas doesn't, uh, hasn't sampled very much at all. Most of their work has been in captive uh, facilities um, that they have been working to do a little bit better, but um, we aren't there yet. Uh, so we jumped to January of 2022. Um, and we can see that now we're starting to see some counties popping up in eastern Kansas. And so to jump to Kansas, starting in 2020 or 2001, when we first picked it up in Harper County in a uh, captive elk. And then we picked up our first uh, wild herd and deer uh, out in Cheyenne in 2005. And so coming now to uh, through 2021, we are, you know, we've, we've crept across the state, but then we've also jumped and spread into uh, the eastern, some eastern counties. Uh, most recently, uh, the Clay County, Morris County, and Bourbon County. Uh, the Bourbon County was actually only a couple miles off the Missouri border. Um, that may be one of our first detections that may have come from the east actually, instead of from the west, but uh, we don't really have any way to confirm that for sure. But it is only a, a jump of one county on the Missouri side to get to a county that they have had a positive in over there. So what do we do? We do surveillance or monitoring. It's surveillance if you are still looking for it. It's monitoring if you've already found it. We work through five zones in Kansas. Uh, the, it's a five-year rotation, so we focus on a specific zone each season and rotate to the next one in a clockwise manner. Uh, last year, we were in the north central zone. This year, we're in the east zone. And so next year, we will be in the south central zone. Uh, we work with our co with cooperators through taxidermists uh, and some processors to collect most of our samples for us. Um, we do uh, pay per sample uh, to those collectors. Uh, we also accept samples from hunters, and they are welcome to submit their own tests, although they would have to pay for it themselves. 
um, to the Kansas State uh, Vet Diagnostic Lab. We do have a current project uh, working with the University of Missouri. It's a three-year project. We just completed, we're working on completing the second year of that project with sampling. And I posted the map to kind of give an idea of where we're focusing in each year. So this last season, uh, or well, current season uh, with antlerless open right now, we are focused on the south central, southwest portions of the state. Although we are accepting samples from anywhere in the state with the project. It's just that we've put some technicians out to focus on uh, getting contacting hunters in the field and also collect some more roadkill uh, samples to try and pick up some uh, sample, samples in places that we normally uh, haven't gotten many samples from and also to get some information on deer that were not uh, specifically selected by hunters to shoot. Um, the idea is that we will get some finer scale data than is possible with our current uh, monitoring or surveillance efforts. Um, with this, we are asking that hunters provide a location of the sample. Um, we've been pretty successful in getting uh, locations uh, within uh, a mile or two of where it was uh, shot. Some hunters will provide a like an intersection of roads or a section township range number. Some are giving us, you know, three miles south and four miles west of whatever town type of locations. Um, one of the goals was then to also identify previously unknown infected areas, um, which we certainly have picked up some counties we had not detected it previously uh, with this project. We also want to estimate the prevalence rate specific in the DMUs, uh, which is a little finer than we are with our zones, because currently with our current uh, surveillance and monitoring, the, the, the prevalence rates of CWD is all limited to the zone. Um, and then also we wanted to explore how CWD is moving in Kansas. Uh, typically deer, especially white-tailed deer tend to follow riparian areas, um, certain habitat types. Uh, and so the idea is that we could hopefully predict how that, how the landscape affects CWD moving um, and help us identify those areas that we likely needed to look a little harder in and focus some more effort because they may be more susceptible or be first kind of first areas where we're first going to pick up CWD uh, in that in that region. Um, so just to kind of cover the 2020 to 2021 season, our surveillance uh, monitoring was in the north central zone. Uh, we got 584 samples. 39 were positive, which is a five to nine percent prevalence rate. Uh, compare that to 2019 when we were in the northwest zone, which is where we've had CWD longer than anywhere, and we're up to a 34 to 49 percent uh, prevalence rate. And that season, our surveillance monitoring picked up Washington, Mitchell, and uh, I added Osage County here. Uh, Washington and Mitchell were both counties that we picked up uh, positive deer uh, samples in uh, through hunters. The Osage County was actually a captive elk that was uh, positive. We have not picked up any other positive samples from wild deer. They actually did, did depopulate that facility and that was the only animal that was positive for CWD on the facility. Uh, so that was a, you know, a, a good move by uh, the Department of Ag and that landowner to uh, go ahead and depopulate. They did get money to indemnify and help pay for the, the loss, um, but they didn't necessarily have to choose to go that route. So a good partnership uh, to get that done. And then the CWD research project samples, we had an, kind of an Eastern zone focus. 
and there were 1,901 samples collected. We had 111 positives. Now those uh, 1,901 samples and 111 positives, while there was a focus on the east side of the state, we did uh, have a lot of submissions from the rest of the state, uh, except most of the north central zone were done through us. So the northwest, southwest, and south central zones uh, samples from there were paid for by that project. So those hunters still had a free test uh, done, um, but that boosted our number of positives for sure. Uh, but we did pick up uh, five new counties, uh, the easternmost being Franklin, uh, but then Kingner, Sumner, Cowley, and Butler counties were all had positives uh, come up. So getting into the 2021 to 22 season so far, uh, our surveillance monitoring zone was the east zone this year. Uh, we don't have all the samples processed or even collected. Uh, that probably won't occur until uh, more towards the end of January once more the antlerless seasons have closed down. Um, but we are over 500 um, again this year. We are set up to detect CWD at approximately 1%. Um, if, if prevalence is at 1%, then we should detect it with our sampling methods. And we've picked up uh, Morris and Bourbon this year through that effort as far as new counties. So right now we're sitting at approximately 1% prevalence in that east zone. Uh, based on that, although final numbers for that will come out once we have a complete uh, results from all our samples. The uh, CWD project focused more on the south central southwest uh, zones, although again we did take samples from the northwest and north central. Uh, with that, we ha have so far 947 samples. Uh, 526 of those are tested, 421 have been submitted to the lab. There's been a somewhat of a holdup from the lab so far. Um, some of those samples were submitted back in, uh, at the, closer to the end of rifle season in December and still we haven't gotten results yet back for them. So we're, we've been kind of hounding the lab to get uh, our results, get those tested and analyzed and get the results to us. So far there's 89 positives. Uh, with that, um, again, that's only out of that 526. Um, we don't know those other 421. And then uh, we did add Clay County this year uh, as a new county through the research project. Although uh, of the samples that have been tested, not all of those were available in the database for me to look up and see what counties they were uh, from. So they were still working on getting that information put together for me. So we do have an additional project that we were able to get some funding uh, last year. It's only a one year project from October to October, uh, but it's a molecular methods for CWD surveillance. Uh, we're gonna work with whitetail and mule deer both and it utilizes the existing samples we're already collecting, already have, but it's gonna let us get some regional estimates of genetic diversity and landscape connectivity and effective population sizes. And with that, uh, we'll be able to look at, you know, that genetic resistance, but also with gene flow, uh, with that landscape connectivity, we can look at how different populations are moving back and forth or may interact and uh, potentially tell us even before we get to uh, detecting CWD in an area, we may be able to determine where it's likely to come from based on movement between animals in different populations. Um, and also look at you know, some of our mule deer uh, herds declines in the Western Kansas just where do we have to be for uh, to maintain that genetic diversity so those populations can uh, at least uh, would have the genetic ability to stay diverse and survive um, 
with uh, a little work, preliminary work so far, we re realized that in some small areas, we were uh, potentially looking at some inbreeding um, mule deer out there. So we also, with that hybridization, uh, we, we picked up a few hybrids with that preliminary work. And so we're gonna investigate how that affects those animals and how that may influence CWD resistance susceptibility uh, in those populations, whether that may help us out or if it is a, uh, gonna hurt us and cause us more problems. Um, so that study so far, uh, we, there's been some samples that have been uh, run through. Uh, they're getting ready to uh, do their second run of uh, testing and genetic work. And then it's gonna come back fairly quick once they've got that to look at where uh, all the different parts of the project. So more to come as that project gets closer and wraps up. So just moving forward, um, we've been developing communications um, to help inform folks, get the word out. And then uh, we also, in working on some human dimensions to work with our hunters and landowners. Um, but in December of 2020, we wrapped up a human dimension survey for Kansas deer hunters. Uh, we did focus on our hunter knowledge and awareness of CWD. Uh, we included non-resident hunters um, because one of the issues with CWD is transmission across state boundaries uh, with folks that either come to a state or take a uh, return it like a Kansas resident returning from hunting out of state that may, in a state that may have CWD or a non-resident coming to Kansas and then potentially taking CWD back uh, home. And we've had a few instances of that in which uh, we had a positive CWD deer show up in Ohio and also in, I believe, South Carolina. And then just this year, we uh, I got a phone call from uh, one of the biologists in Texas that they tested a deer that came from Kansas and it was positive. So uh, we've got to be a little better as hunters to not uh, be our own worst enemy and spread CWD. So just kind of some of the highlights of that survey, 83% of hunters knew CWD existed in Kansas. 51% knew there was no cure. 58 knew about uh, the testing that we do. Uh, there's some support for additional hunting opportunities or potentially increasing harvest for CWD management, trying to reduce uh, the spread that way. Only 21% of hunters supported a ban on baiting or feeding or using minerals. 8% uh, wanted to take no action to manage CWD. Uh, and then there was a high level of trust in our communications and management efforts um, from those uh, folks. So we at least, uh, folks are, they, they understand it's there. Um, they've learned some, but we certainly have a way to go as far as what we need to get out to folks. And so then to jump on the research end of it, uh, we keep an eye on that our wildlife disease coordinator and I, um, and many of our staff are immensely helpful on seeing some of that and letting us know about it to kind of keep on track of that. Things going on across the country that are of interest. Um, there's a growing concern about that financial, you know, what what's the kind of economic impact of CWD to uh, not just a state agency, but to the residents of a state that, you know, such as some of Western Kansas, that there's a pretty important segment there of having, you know, folks come out to hunt and paying for that. And so what, what kind of impact does that have when CWD hits certain levels? Um, how does that affect that whole economy uh, from hunting uh, big game? Also, there's some advances in testing going on right now. There's a new 
test that's being worked on called RT Quick. Um, and it is potentially more sensitive than our current test that we use. So we could be able to pick up CWD sooner, but also with different materials than lymph nodes or brain stems. They're finding that they can pick, it, pick up CWD in saliva and blood. So, uh, and there's some hope that eventually that could be developed into a, uh, maybe not necessarily a, a, a field test where you would know right away, but something that you could potentially sample a deer after you shoot it and know within a day or two um, because you were able to do it yourself even if you had to wait for the test to kind of work um, rather than the current about a two to three week wait is pretty typical when you have to uh, mail in the samples to a lab and then wait for them to process and return them or return results to you. Um, there's also some new information coming out from different places about the effect on populations over time now. Uh, most of that is showing that once you hit certain prevalence rates, your population no longer uh, can sustain itself. There's the mortality rate from CWD exceeds uh, the uh, recruitment into the population. And so keeping an eye on that, seeing how that goes, um, but uh, and then trying to apply some of that to what we see in Kansas. Um, we're also continuing our education efforts. Um, again, that information from the Human Dimension Survey was more of a, we established kind of a baseline. Now we can figure out, you know, what efforts are helping us improve over time. Uh, but just trying to get the word out with that, help hunters understand, you know, why it's important to be concerned about chronic waste and disease and what they can do to help. Uh, and then speaking of education, uh, we did put together a uh, website specific to CWD, uh, cwdks.com. And that is something that our uh, public affairs office has done a fantastic job of getting that up and going. Uh, Nadia and uh, Brody have done a great job there. Uh, we didn't have any of the metrics from this to share at this time. So, you know, in the, in the future, hopefully we'll have some little more of what impact we've gotten with that. Um, I've actually gotten calls from my counterparts in different states that have seen this and wanted to compliment us on doing such a good job with this site and getting information out to folks through it. And so with that, I will finish up um, and if there are questions, I will be happy to answer them. Any questions for Levi? Levi, this is Commissioner Spohr. In, in your opinion, is chronic wasting disease in every county, but it just hasn't been detected through testing? Levi, Jaster, Emporia. At this point, I can't say for certain. Um, I don't know that I would feel all that surprised at any county having a positive sample at this point coming back. I mean, disappointed, definitely, but I, I just don't know that I, you know, find having it pop up in Bourbon County this year, you know, if it, we had one pop up in uh, extreme northeast or down in the very southeast corner, wherever in there, I can't say that I'd be necessarily be surprised. It's possible that it's everywhere. Is it affecting the mule deer and the whitetail equally the same? There, there are some differences uh, depending on which study you read, whether or not it does. Uh, specifically in Kansas, I, I can't say one way or the other. Um, there's a lot going on with whitetail and mule deer uh, where they are sympatric, where they both occur that obscure some of that. 
but in some cases what they found is that it it may affect one more than the other other cases there's not really a difference so thank you this is commissioner sill um are you seeing any impact um particularly where the prevalence rates are higher in people not taking as many does if they're thinking prevalence rates are high i can't eat the meat anyway why shoot does not so much that reason i think in some of those areas uh they are self-limiting because they're seeing some of those population level effects where that north northwest zone uh we're at or past the point where population declined from CWD according to a couple of different studies on that. And so it may be more that they're just seeing, they're not seeing as many deer, so they're not taking deer. So they're self-limiting in hopes that, you know, they may help recover the population, um, but it may be past that point. Levi, Chairman Lover. There's still been no case of where CWD has jumped species. I mean, from I just, urban maybe, but not to humans. Or. Em, emporia. Um, well, we'll qualify that with there's not been a proven case of a human getting it. Um, they have been able to, especially in laboratories, cause other species to get CWD. Um, how, how likely that is outside of a laboratory, I, I couldn't say. Um, in some cases, there may be barriers that were circumvented based on how they dosed animals in a lab um, that you wouldn't, you know, so it wouldn't necessarily find it. But I'm at, at this point, I'm not aware of anybody that's detected it in another species in the wild. Um, although potentially some of that is also covered by it just gets listed as a form of whatever that species uh, transmissional spongiform encephalopathy is. So uh, there has been some uh, ramblings, uh, considerations that maybe some, a person has gotten it, but it got classified as CJD instead, or, you know, possibly a uh, cow or a sheep could get it, but where you'd call it scrapey or BSC, I don't know for sure. But there's certainly <coughs> concerning things laboratory that are not necessarily saying it's completely limited that way. Okay. Other questions for me, Bye. Cameron Lover, we do have one from the public. Okay. Dustin, let me get you unmuted here. Hey, Levi, Dustin King. I like the beard. Looks good. So uh, it might be a two-part question. Uh, and I know we kind of talked in the past a little bit, I guess the, the first question is, you know, and, and appreciate the information because I hadn't seen a lot of that, but we had the first case, I think, is what you said at the beginning of the presentation was in 01, so 20 years ago. And from what I understand, um, I guess my question is, is, the first question is, what have we done to do? I'm, we're educating people. We're collecting a lot of information, and we've been doing that. But it's been 20 years. What are we actually doing, or is there anything in place other than just educating people and collecting information on controlling <laughs> Yeah, so Levi Jastrum Poria. Um, we did uh, change our regulations to uh, facilitate hunters being able to uh, leave the worst of the material, infectious material with the head and the spine uh, in the field. Um, whereas before, prior to changing that, our proof of sex required a head being attached or you had to photo check. So there was an option, but maybe not the best option. Um, for folks. That's one way. Um, the other way is that in uh, some cases, especially that northwest corner of the state, we have kept uh, antler 
list seasons in place potentially longer than we might have at times to facilitate some of that harvest. Um, and that's been, those are the two major ways. Um, as from that study, you know, from our human dimensions uh, survey, you know, there's, there's little agreement among our, among our hunters what, uh, what we should necessarily do. There's, there's definitely concern that we need to do something, but there's not much agreement on what should necessarily be done and what's acceptable to do. Um, we've, you know, we've looked at carcass transport restrictions. There's some issues with that in a state like Kansas where uh, some folks have some trouble with, uh, if we restrict that too much, they have trouble getting home or to a processor finding those folks. Um, those are, those are the main things we've looked at so far. There's certainly other, other things that potentially could be done, provided we find the right way to do them. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I guess the second part, and, and I, I think you probably know this is coming. So the, the baiting aspect of it, uh, bait piles where, you know, deer congregating, I understand it's not a silver bullet and there's better, there's other things that we can do. But if there's one thing that could be controlled, common sense says deer congregating is going to spread disease, whether it's CWD or anything else. What benefit are those bait piles providing us and why do we, is that something we can take action on? I know it's, I know yep. it's not the popular vote because you just, <laughs> you just showed that, but you yep. got to, you got to also yep. consider there's alternative motives to those as well. I'm not going to get yep. into an ethical conversation, but you know what I mean? I mean, if that's something that could, I mean, it's definitely doing more harm than good from a disease standpoint. Why wouldn't we pursue that a little bit? And, and that's discussions we've had. That's, that's the difficult part is that it's, it's not well supported even. And we gave, when we did that survey, we gave options to, um, to, you know, limited outside of hunting season, limited certain ways that other states have done where you can only have so much bait at a time out there to reduce that. And, uh, you know, nothing really came back, but it is certainly an issue. And when you start having animals stick their noses in the exact same places, it's, it's certainly a potential to spread disease and not just CWD, but other diseases too. Right. Um, one of the counter arguments is that, well, the deer socially are licking each other and in contact that way. So what's the difference, but, you know, artificially concentrating animals anytime is a problem. So, okay. I agree. This is commissioner. So, um, this is just, a. um, I guess it's a little related to Dustin's comments there in that we've been investing in surveillance for 26 years and monitoring for 21. That's a significant amount of time and, and staff time and funds um, just to contribute to the larger body of research, which is very valuable, but to just watch it march across the state and the map tonight is extremely frustrating to me that we've been monitoring for 21 years and I would say how's that working for us um why spend additional significant funds on research for monitoring it as we watch it go across the state when we know it's there um why not spend those months stop stop doing your monitoring in essence and start working on um, more education, if we're not going to um, do anything to create management zones, regulate either carcass move management movement or congregating, um, I'm, I'm quite frustrated by that amount of time and money spent with no action. Um, part of what I'm concerned about too is um, how to 
there's other states that, you know, are creating management zones. They're, they're taking action. And I wonder um, what our reputation is among other states that are doing that when we do nothing. My third comment, and this will be the last one I make here, and I, is you tell us as a commission, you've got to let the science lead. You've got to let the science lead. And yet we're not letting the science lead in this regard. We're letting public opinion, um, all kinds of other um, factors influence the decision. Um, it's like the 8% that don't want anything done or are going to, you know, be the winners here. Um, if we really want to let science lead, then it needs to lead all the time. I realize that doesn't eliminate the human dimensions part, but it don't tell us as a commission, let the science lead one time and then not another. I find that frustrating. Thank you. I appreciate you listening. Levi Jasper Emporia, um, one of the big reasons that we do continue to monitor even that, over that time is that our hunters want to know and they want those tests. And so we have uh, provided that too. Um, the other thing is that's going to give us that back history so that uh, looking at those populations going forward, some of that new information that's come out here in the last couple of years, um, we'll be able to take it back and look at and get a much better idea of where we're going. I, I can't say that where we're going is going to look good <laughs> at all. Um, so having that is important in what we do. Um, and with some of the other parts of it is that we also are in a partnership with our hunters, with our landowners and folks. And other states have certainly at times tried to completely lead with science and only go with that. And basically every time it's been a train wreck because there's a lot of backlash through it. And so dealing with some of that and, and Frankly, with big game management in most places, we haven't necessarily done things completely biologically uh, in many places because we were always in such a good place biologically that it could completely, it could all, all the management was social management. You know, what, what is the you know, acceptable level of crop damage? What's acceptable for vehicle accidents? That kind of stuff. And, and so, it really has gotten to be a, you know, a good partnership in that we have to take that into account. Uh, but we have forgotten that at times there is a point where, you know, the biology needs to override some of the social, um, and we have to realize that. But, you know, that's that's the tough balance that we've got to try to reach. Unfortunately, the science has a lot of elasticity to it, and uh, it's not as crisp as some things. And it may be that everything we do may be, we, we can't do anything about it, it may be inevitable. That's not to say we shouldn't try to do something, but it's, it's just not as cut and dried as for us to say you can't move carcasses, you got to eat it in the field. There's, we, you could be so safe that it destroys uh, the culture. Brad, you had your hand up. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Secretary Loveless. I, th I think um, it's a good discussion for certain. Uh, it's clear as Levi stated this, that the science isn't clear when it comes to baiting. Uh, we know there can be a downside, but we've had this conversation during commission meetings and outside. And it's not clear that that is a, a proven method to reduce the spread. Uh, we could try it. And I think th there would be strong voices on both sides. Certainly we disappoint some, some hunters who see value in baiting. 
Um, and that's what's caused us to, to pause on making that recommendation because we know, we know people value it and we don't feel like the science is clear on that. I think you brought up another point though about what would be effective. And it seems to me it was about a year ago where we initiated a conversation on, on movement zones, drawing boundaries where deer carcasses couldn't cross. And, and it was this body that discussed that. And that, as I recall, didn't come to a strong conclusion. Very difficult subject. And, and none of us on the staff said, it's black and white, we need to do this, and here's how we implement it, and, it, and it'll, it'll work. Uh, there were a lot of rough edges, but certainly I think if, if the commission would like to uh, rekindle that conversation, I think it's very germane. It's, uh, that is something that we think could have measurable effect. It's messy and difficult, but, but I, I applaud your, your uh, raising the concern about, about what we can do that'll be meaningful. Uh, that's one step that I think, although difficult, would, would prove meaningful in terms of trying to reduce the spread. I think we should continue to have more discussion on CWD and some of these issues. Uh, I... I'm not saying that the total spread in Kansas is a foregone conclusion. And I think that in some cases, baiting is an area to which probably would have less damage to the hunting culture and might have some positive effect. Uh, Levi mentioned at a previous meeting, CWD travels at 55 miles an hour. And uh, so that's going to be even harder to deal with. But I think we should continue to focus a little bit more on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've got it on our list for, for next meeting. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Levi? Well, Levi, that was a good presentation. Not exactly upbeat, but uh, we want to hear and as you see it. So uh, that's all the business we have. Is there any uh, other items that we need to deal with today? Well, we have our next meeting set up for March 31st. We'll let you know whether we have it virtually or whether we have it live. Is there any other questions or comments? Sheila, is there any other things we need to do? I don't believe so. I think all the meetings for pretty much for this year, our dates are set are pretty close. All right, Brad, do you have anything else? Uh, no, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a it's been a good meeting, and uh, uh, I appreciate all the heartfelt uh, comments and and investment that both the commission and and our staff has made. I thought we heard some really exceptional presentations tonight, uh, and pretty provocative. So I appreciate all that and and your conversation around that. All right. Well, thank you all. Enjoy the weather. The meeting is adjourned. Good night. Good night.